Sarah is a known quantity to some of you in this room, many of you in this room, um, not to some of you. Uh, so Sarah was a member of Hope Point at one point in time. Uh, we miss her greatly, and I know Sherry and the choir miss her <laughs> greatly too. Um, I met Sarah in passing, sort of uh, ships <laughs> passing in the night, mostly at uh, Providence Classical School when I was coming in, and she was on her way out. Um, and I got to teach students that Sarah taught over many, many years. And so I got to see the fruits of Sarah's labor as a teacher, uh, which are tremendous. I mean, that, that was a ragtag bunch of students, uh, lots of punks in that class, but every single one of them, even those who I know were under quite a bit of discipline in Sarah's class, spoke highly of her universally, even those who I know really struggled. And that says a tremendous amount about Sarah as a person and Sarah as a teacher. And so um, that is why she was one of the first people that came to my mind thinking, okay, who, who, what three people are we going to have to talk about C.S. Lewis to teach us? So hopefully no one has to be disciplined in this room today. Silence your cell phones. But um, Sarah has a commanding presence, so I have n uh, no doubt she would reprimand you for being on your cell phone, as I knew she did to a certain someone who some, some of us know um, many times. So uh, let's pray, and I'll welcome Sarah. Heavenly Father, I give you thanks for Sarah, for her heart for teaching, for the way in which she has shaped many, many students in their trajectories in this world. Lord, not only uh, to fill them with knowledge, but also to strengthen their character and to point them towards you and towards your son. And so, Lord, tonight as she teaches us here, May we receive her words, uh, the knowledge that she brings. May we learn alongside her with C.S. Lewis. And God, would you strengthen us through what she teaches us that we might be more faithful followers of your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Come on up, Sarah. Thanks so much, Brother Michael. Um, it is really great to be here with you all tonight. Uh, I moved to Texas almost eight years ago. And since then, I've been a longtime friend of Hope Point, and Hope Point has been a longtime friend of me. I got married in this church, so I'm really, really grateful to be here with you all tonight and deeply grateful for this time together. I've, uh, I've learned a lot from Daniel and Daryl, so I think I've told several of you, I hope I can bring something that's half as good as what, uh, what they brought, uh, but we'll think together tonight about some, some things in the Great Divorce. So I'll just start with a tiny bit of background on myself to kind of tell you why I picked the Great Divorce for tonight. Um, I graduated from a small liberal arts college and then taught high school humanities for several years before I got married and had two children. And one of the books that I taught in my very first year as an intern was The Great Divorce to a ragtag bunch of 11th graders. Uh, and it's funny, I was telling Daryl about this uh, a couple weeks ago, and he asked me if I was able to reuse anything, and I had to say, listen, Daryl, when I taught this book, I was straight out of college. I was not even a full first-year teacher. I was an intern. I didn't know anything. I did not know which way was up, okay? <laughs> so thanks be to God, I did not reuse anything. Uh, from when I taught The Great Divorce all those years ago. Uh, and I really haven't picked it up either since then, but the Holy Spirit kind of seemed to guide me towards that work when, when thinking about this lecture. So, so here we are. Um, but let me give you a little bit of context for the book. If you haven't read it, it's a brilliant, short, fictional work. You can get through it in one to two sittings. It's maybe two to three hours of total read time, um, if that. It was published as serial magazine segments in 1945, so it's real easy to pick up and put down uh, if, you, if you need something like that. The setting of the novel is a little weird. The setting is after death. Now, you might be thinking, wait, 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 isn't the setting supposed to be a place? And you're right, the setting is supposed to be a place. But this book is kind of an exception. It makes more sense to call the setting a time rather than a place. So the setting is just after death. It's after the people in the book have died. We don't know if it's like after the end times or just after the people in the book have died. So since we're already in kind of weird territory as far as where and when this book takes place, before I go any further, I want to reiterate, The Great Divorce 
is a work of fiction. Okay? It's completely fanciful. It's not meant to be an account of what happens after we die. It's totally imagined. So even at the very end of the book, the protagonist, who is Lewis himself, wakes up and realizes that everything's just been a dream. Okay? So it's not about the end times, not about the afterlife, whether purgatory exists, nothing like this. Instead, its main goal is to illustrate the constant and overwhelming sins of people and how these sins get in the way of salvation. Okay, so let's talk about the plot just a little bit. The story opens with the protagonist, who is Lewis, in line to get on a bus, okay? It's in a dreary town, just stuck in this eternal twilight. The sun is always just about to set. There's a drizzle of rain constantly falling. Not very many people are out and about. It's gloomy and overcast. So it's not a super warm or inviting place. But it's not a haunted house either, right? It's just kind of bleh. Um, and Lewis has wandered around for an unspecified amount of time until he finds this bus queue already full of several others. And nobody at the bus seems particularly remarkable. And eventually he finds out that everybody is kind of disagreeable in some way or another. But eventually some of them board the bus and begin a journey, okay? Even though nobody seems to know where they're going. And to their surprise, instead of touring the dreary cityscape, the bus goes in a real weird direction, up. Yeah, the bus flies off the ground, okay, to eventually reach a second place. Now, the second place is the complete opposite of the first place, okay? It is basically perfect. It's a beautiful, bright landscape full of greenness and light. It's always on the brink of sunrise. Picture something like the countryside of the Shire or something like this, okay? So after getting off the bus in the second place, Lewis realizes that everything in this new land is like capital R real, okay, in a way that he himself is not. Everything is solider than he is. A leaf weighs a thousand pounds in his hand, and the blades of grass are so sharp that they cut his feet when he walks. Now, the visitors that came on the bus stick out like a sore thumb in this place. They don't belong here. Even a waterfall is somehow more real than they are. They don't fit in with the brightness and enormity that they find themselves in. Okay, so against this new geography, Lewis comes to realize something important. Those on the bus, including himself, are not really fully men, but they are ghosts, shades of men who once were. Remember that this book takes place after death, so the ghosts used to be humans in life, but now they're like shadows of men after they've died. Okay, so after a while, the ghosts are met by some beings who approach the bus from afar. And these beings are visibly different than the ghosts. These people belong in the new place. They're bright and beautiful and powerful. They're full-bodied. And as they walk, the earth trembles under their feet. Okay, and instead of the blades of grass cutting their ankles, their bare feet make deep impressions in the earth. So we find out that these beings are what Lewis calls spirits. In life, these spirits used to be humans as well. But after death, they are transformed not into ghosts, but spirits by rising with Christ into glory. So we also learn that these spirits have journeyed a long, long way for a long, long time to meet specific ghosts. And each spirit has come with one singular purpose, to convince a particular ghost to stay in the bright place rather than return back to the dreary place. Seems easy, right? Who wouldn't want to live in the Shire? Okay. So Lewis is able to witness various conversations between spirits and ghosts as each ghost makes the choice to either stay in the bright place or return to the dreary place. Okay, so at this point, you might be thinking, where are we? <laughs> what is this dreary place and what is the bright place? We sort of know when this book takes place, but do we ever find out where these people are? Yes, we do. As you might have guessed, since all of this takes place after death, the dreary place is basically hell, and the bright place is basically heaven. If the bright place is heaven and the dreary place is hell, then the spirits are basically the saved, and the ghosts are basically the unsaved. Okay, so quick recap. Unsaved ghosts from hell take a bus to heaven and meet saved spirits. The saved spirits try to convince the ghosts to stay in heaven rather than return to hell. So what's the catch? Why would anybody choose to go back to hell? To answer that question, let me try to quickly tell you what this book is. The work is 
for all intents and purposes, a series of dialogues between the ghosts and the spirits. And the point of these dialogues is to illustrate the sins that prevent repentance and salvation in the ghosts. It offers us a chance to see what is keeping these ghosts from choosing heaven. And the gestalt switch that these ghosts need turns out to be a certain kind of death, a spiritual death of their sins. Each of the ghosts has his or her own pet sin okay, that has so far prevented that ghost from entering the kingdom of heaven. So if they can give up their sin, they can stay in heaven. I have to give a spoiler alert. Most of the ghosts fail to repent. But the one ghost who does choose to stay in heaven must first experience a spiritual death of his pet sin. We've all heard that we must die with Christ to rise with him, and these ghosts get a second chance to accept spiritual death after their physical death, since they did not do so during life. So in the rest of this lecture, I want to look a little closer at two ghosts in particular. One ghost chooses to hold on to her sin, and the other ghost chooses to let his die. But by choosing to die, the male ghost actually chooses to remain in heaven and receive eternal life. So the female ghost chooses to return to hell, unable to experience the spiritual death of her sin. And after looking at what these two examples have to offer us during Lent, I'll recommend just a couple of practices for you to consider as we approach Easter. So our first conversation takes place between an angel and a ghost who doesn't have a name, but his besetting sin is lust, so I'll just refer to him as the man or the ghost of lust. At first, it seems like the man of lust has a bus companion. He travels with a visible personification of his sin, a lizard that sits on his shoulder, to represent the lust that has become his religion. It is his constant companion. It haunts him wherever he goes, even the doorstep of heaven. The lizard is clearly the one in control. He whispers in the ghost's ear and he twitches his tail, and the ghost responds with impatience and anger and resistance. But ultimately, he obeys the lizard. It's a parasite, sucking out what remnants of life remain in the ghost. So after spending some time in heaven, the ghost reluctantly begins to head back to the bus, intending to leave because his lizard is not behaving. He tries to tell the lizard that his stuff won't do here and that he needs to really be quiet. But the lizard has his own plans and refuses to listen to the ghost. In the middle of this predicament, an angel appears and offers to solve the ghost problem. Instead of both lizard and ghost going home, the angel offers to make the lizard be quiet. The ghost seems very interested till he realizes that the angel's solution is a lot more drastic than he would like. The angel is not offering to tame or muzzle the lizard. He will not teach the lizard some manners or allow him to speak at the appropriate time. The angel offers only to kill the lizard. Lewis masterfully paints this as the only option for the ghost, but he explores almost every other possibility. The ghost suggests delaying the death of the lizard since killing him now would be a little too drastic. The ghost ponders just silencing the lizard and even says at one point that the problem has already been solved since the lizard went to sleep all by himself. In a very inventive move, he suggests that the gradual process might be better than killing it. The ghost of lust promises again and again to really think over what the angel has proposed. He's doing his absolute best to delay the inevitable choice before him. But as much as he would like to delay, he has arrived at the root of the problem, the ultimate question. Will he give up his sin for the kingdom of heaven? The reason none of the ghost's options will work is that lust is a sin and sin will not be tamed. Sin cannot in any way, shape, or form enter the kingdom of heaven. It must die, plain and simple. There is no such thing as an obedient vice before the throne of God. So here we are. It's the moment of truth. The rubber is about to hit the road. There's no other day and no other way. As the angel says, this moment contains all moments. And as it turns out, There's no such thing as the gradual process for eradicating sin. Some of you might be remembering from Daryl's lecture, right, a couple of weeks ago, that the gradual process to hell still gets you to hell. Evidently, this doesn't apply here. The gradual process cannot work for this moment. Only death, right now, will be the end of it. The ghost must choose now what will be his allegiance, lust or infinite eternal joy. So here's where the interesting part happens. 
the ghost fears being killed himself, even though the angel promises that he will not die. The ghost thinks about the lizard's death and says, I know it will kill me. To which the angel responds, it won't. But supposing it did, he says, you're right. It would be better to be dead than to live with this creature. And that's when he makes his choice. After a scream of agony, the lizard dies, but that's not the end of it. Both lizard and man are immediately transformed. The ghost becomes a full-bodied spirit, and the lizard becomes a grand stallion. In a dramatic exit, they ride off towards the eternal sunrise, being made into spirits who belong forever in heaven. So, what does this analogy teach us as we walk through the season of Lent? Spiritual death of sin results in spiritual life with Christ. Death and birth, although opposites, are very deeply connected. We all know that everyone who is born must eventually die. And when thought of this way, birth can seem like a kind of doorway to death. Think about this. As soon as a baby is born, the clock is ticking. Okay, that baby, fresh from the womb, has numbered days on earth that will eventually come to an end. The beginning of life is also the beginning of death. I have the great fortune of still having two grandparents alive, both in their 90s, and my 95-year-old grandpa still insists on driving a motor vehicle. But don't worry, he lives on the East Coast. You're not going to meet him on the road. And although he still insists that he can drive a car, his decline is evident, and he lives in a state of visible decay, right? He walks very slowly and with a stoop. He bruises easily, he's lost a lot of hearing and a lot of memory, and when I picture him, his death approaches in a way that it doesn't seem to for me. It seems really odd for me to look at my two-and-a-half-year-old or my five-month-old and feel like death has the same kind of imminence for them. And yet, my children are just as mortal as anyone at any point in their lives. I think sometimes we look with inaccurate eyes when we assume that we have more time than the very moment that's in front of us. In reality, we might all die in the next 10 minutes. We insist to young people, you have your whole life ahead of you, but how much time is a whole life? This varies from person to person. And even the number of days we have yet to live is unknown to the wisest of us. Now, we cannot live like we're gonna die in the next 10 minutes. I would not suggest that, but Thinking about death accurately helps us to live life more purposely because in the same way that birth is the beginning of death, it seems like death is, for those who claim it, the beginning of life. For the Christian, death is the very doorway to eternal life. And this is the case for both physical death and spiritual death. When my 95-year-old grandpa physically dies, he will, praise God, really live again when he is united with Christ. This is true for spiritual death as well. When we spiritually die, we begin to spiritually live. Jesus says to Nicodemus in John 3, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives first birth to flesh, but Spirit gives birth to Spirit. To enter the kingdom of heaven, one must be born again, and to be born again, we must first die and be buried with Christ. If we have not died spiritually, we cannot live spiritually. If death is the doorway to life and being born again, then the result of spiritual death of sin is spiritual life with Christ. So instead of something to be afraid of, death becomes something to be embraced. But it goes one step further, though. Not only does death result in life, but the consequence of the spiritual death of sin is that very sin, first killed and then transformed, being brought into God's glorious story of redemption. Just as the ghost is transformed into a spirit, the lizard is transformed along with him into a stallion. His sin does not just go away. Okay? It is transformed and made into something new. The stallion becomes part of the man as the lizard was part of the ghost, but in a different way. Lust defined the ghost, dominated him. But after lust is redeemed, it becomes part of his story. And because it was redeemed, the memory of what it once was, compared to what it has become, can bring glory to Christ. Lewis explains it a lot better than I can. Let me see if I can get my first quote up here. Nothing, not even the best and noblest, can go on as it is now. Nothing, not even what is lowest and most bestial, will not be raised again if it submits to death. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. What is a lizard compared with a stallion? 
Lust is a poor, weak, whimpering, whispering thing compared with that richness and energy of desire which will arise when lust has been killed. In light of salvation, in light of the resurrection, every experience is meaningful because it participates in some way in Christ's narrative, the story of the cross. When sin is buried with Christ, it is transformed as he was. It does not just die as Christ did not just die. Christ rose again, as will our evilness and wickedness, into the story of goodness. The evil will be co-opted by the good. Lewis reiterates that love, as mortals understand the word, isn't enough. Every natural love will rise again and live forever in this country, but none will rise again until it has been buried. But, 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 there's one catch. We have to choose spiritual death. God does not choose it for us. But when we choose death, we are really choosing life, which actually makes death a choice of love. For the man of lust, the angel refuses to kill the lizard without the man's consent. And as Lewis illustrates, the choice to die does belong with us. And this is itself a gift of love from God. Peter Grief puts this idea eloquently in his book, Love is Stronger Than Death, when he says, love is free. It does not rape. It seduces. God in his infinite love does not force us to give up our besetting sins. He does not require that we say yes to salvation. We do have to choose death with Christ. And if we don't choose death, we choose hell. It's clear in The Great Divorce that Lewis sees hell as each man's personal choice. His famous line about heaven and hell occurs earlier in the book, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek, find. To those who knock, it is opened. In John 5, before Jesus heals the man at the pool who has been paralyzed for 38 years, he first asks the man, do you want to get well? The man almost conspicuously does not answer with either yes or no, but his response to Jesus' command to get up and walk is evidence enough. He could have laughed in disbelief. He could have ignored this random stranger's bizarre command. Instead, he gets up and walks. In the great divorce, the man of lust has to choose and decide that he does want to be rid of his lust. Only then does the angel act. If dying is a choice, it is a choice for love. Death is not sought for its own sake, but as the path to life. So, we've talked through the first ghost, the ghost who says yes to heaven. To recap, our sin has to die. But death is not the end. It is a choice of love and the beginning of life. Not even sin can escape being sown into God's narrative of grace and redemption. So, let's look now at the ghost who does not choose death, but instead chooses hell. The second ghost actually doesn't have a name either. <laughs> but we know in life her husband's name was Robert, so I'll just call her the wife of Robert. We meet the wife of Robert mid-conversation with a female spirit. She is adamantly refusing to meet Robert, who lives permanently in heaven. It seems in her small-mindedness that all of heaven is somehow not big enough for the two of them. And she claims that she is ready to forgive Robert as a Christian, but follows that up with some things one can never forget. We learn that in their life together, the wife of Robert dominated every part of her husband's existence until he was no longer his own person. Robert's wife forces him to give up all of his desires for hers. She demands that he get a higher paying job, work longer hours, move to a bigger house, give up his close friends, and abandon his ambition of writing a book. He becomes a shadow of a man, controlled by his wife, until he has a nervous breakdown and dies. The wife of Robert, however, does not view her manipulation as the cause of his death, but instead as his saving grace. Instead of suffocating him, she says that it was she who made a man out of him. She complains that his lack of ambition was why she encouraged him to get the higher paying job. She says, I had to positively nag him to take on that extra work in the other department, though it was really the beginning of everything for him. She talks about having to drag him through conversation at the end of a long day, with no help from him, of course. He dreamed of writing a book, an ambition of which she ultimately 
obscured him. When Robert wants to get together with his old friends, his wife forces them to meet in her home. Slowly and painstakingly, she drives his friends away by making them feel uncomfortable in her home. But this is, of course, all for Robert's own good. After Robert takes a new job to satisfy his wife, he just hopes for a little peace. But not to be discouraged when she's just getting started, Robert's wife decides to find a bigger house for them, even when they can't afford it. Although he's sad, Robert complies. Everything continues to be done with Robert's best interest at heart. The wife of Robert remarks, I began to entertain properly. No more of his sort of friends. I was doing it all for his sake. Every useful friend he ever made was due to me. Even though Robert does not seem to enjoy his life since he sank into himself and walked with a stoop, his wife continues to insist that all that is done to him is really done for him. She explains that she is trying desperately to save him from himself. And in the end, when Robert does have a nervous breakdown, his wife's conscience is clear. She says, I've done my duty by him, if ever a woman has. After Robert's wife finishes her complaint, it's clear that she does not have any remorse and will not change her perspective. Instead, she selfishly says that if allowed, she will take up her burden once more. With all the time one would have in heaven, I believe I could make something out of him. It becomes clear that the wife of Robert is only interested in possessing Robert rather than seeing him flourish as his own person. And when the spirit woman tells her that she cannot have Robert, she outright begs. She says, please, I'm so miserable. I must have someone to do things to. No one minds me at all. I can't alter them. Give him back to me. It isn't right. It isn't fair. I want Robert. She leaves heaven this way unable to see her actions for what they are. In the end, what made this couple's marriage a lifetime of misery boils down to two things. First, they don't agree about what makes a good life. And second, instead of compromising, the wife of Robert responds with only selfishness and dominance. Robert's wife fails to see him as a human being. Instead, she treats him like a workhorse. Yet she is determined to deny her wrongdoing. Ultimately, she cannot repent of her sin because she cannot see that what she's doing is wrong. She clings to her sin like a security blanket. But in her mind, it is not vice that she clings to, but virtue. So what do we learn from the wife of Robert? The wife of Robert teaches us that repenting of our sin means we must first attend to it. We have to acknowledge it to do something about it. But you say, wait, 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 wait. It's very uncomfortable to talk about my sin. Yeah, it is uncomfortable, okay? More often than not, when people disagree or have a conflict, there is outright denial of wrongdoing instead of admission of guilt. It's really pretty amazing. People will do anything to avoid admitting that they're wrong. Okay, quick survey. How many of you have heard an apology that starts like this? I'm sorry if. None of you, you all are surrounded by a bubble of perfect saints, okay? I hear this all the time, right? I'm sorry if, lots of apologies start that way, okay? It sounds like, I'm sorry if I ruined your plans, or I'm sorry if your feelings were hurt. But the problem with these kinds of statements is that they don't actually offer any admission of guilt. They are, when you get technical about it, conditional statements about whoever has been offended. It would be the same thing to say, it's really unfortunate that your feelings were hurt, but I didn't do anything to cause that. But an actual apology says, I'm sorry I hurt your feelings. Right? There's an ownership there. For forgiveness to be meaningful to the one seeking it, there must be ownership of wrongdoing. Apologizing, admission of sin, is by nature a vulnerable state. It puts you at the mercy of the one you're apologizing to. But this is the only way that forgiveness can be truly understood. If I sin against somebody else, they might, in an abundance of grace, just forgive me without me apologizing first. But I won't really understand their forgiveness. To understand forgiveness requires repentance, requires admitting that I'm wrong, it requires being vulnerable, it requires being exposed. So to illustrate this, I want to turn briefly to Luke 7, which tells the story of a conversation between Jesus and Simon about the woman who anoints Jesus' feet with perfume. So when Simon becomes appalled that Jesus would allow such an act to take place, Jesus replies, saying this to Simon. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. 
One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which one will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. The more we understand our own sin, the more we understand what has been forgiven, and the more freely we can give love and forgiveness. Just like people sometimes have strange ideas about what makes an apology, there also seems to be a weird idea out there that something is a sin only if it's done, if it's acted out, if it's committed. But sins of omission are still sins. We are still culpable for negligence. Daryl talked about this as well, right? A lot of our small sins fall into this category. The familiar Anglican prayer of repentance says, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Unfortunately, it's not enough to try really hard not to sin. If you sin, you sin, whether you meant to or not. Instead, we must actively act towards eradicating sin, killing it. And sometimes even trying hard is not enough. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I'm sure the wife of Robert didn't mean to stifle her husband into having nerves break down, and because of that, she thinks she's innocent. This is sadly not the case. Attention to sin, awareness of our own fault, is the first step to killing it. Attention to sin requires openness to recognizing it. The wife of Robert is completely blind to her own sin. She has rewritten the story of her husband's demise at her hands as the story of her valiant efforts to save him. There's no possibility the wife of Robert can recognize her sin because she's already decided that it cannot possibly exist. If we are close to the idea that there might be sin lurking around, we will never see it. We can never attend to what our eyes are closed to. Okay, deep breath. These are hefty themes and can feel like harsh words, especially for the season of Lent when we are constantly thinking and talking about sin and death. It is extremely difficult and humbling to recognize our sin for what it is. And remember, only one ghost out of maybe 20 in the great divorce is able to look at his sin and repent. I'm reminded of the rich young ruler who, even though he kept all of the Lord's commandments since his youth, went away in sorrow from Jesus because of the one thing that was left, his great wealth. Even when we think we're doing it all correctly, there's still something lurking in the shadows. Sin can feel really Sisyphean, right? You push the rock up the hill and it rolls all the way back down. You get rid of one sin and there's just another one waiting right back where you started. So what do we do in light of all this sin? How do we attend to our sin and choose death and thereby choose life? Let me suggest a couple of things to maybe consider in these closing stages of Lent. First suggestion, spend some time in silence. A common practice during Lent is to engage in periods of silence. The Lord speaks to us when we are ready to listen, and silence is a good way to listen. As we've seen, there's great temptation to rationalize our vices and convert them into virtues, but we can learn to better see our sin when we are quiet, in spirit and voice, listening. Peter Kreeft says again, we do not hear God when we are busy speaking. God shows up only when we shut up. Job's best words are his last. The words of Job are ended. Then God appears. He says, be still and know that I am God. We reply, no God, you be still and know that I am me. In silence, after we are finished filling the air with our complaints, after we are finished rationalizing our actions, then we are ready to hear what God has to say. When we get to the point of the psalmist in Psalm 62, for God alone my soul waits in silence, then we will hear God speak. Sister Wendy Beckett describes silence as a condition of surrender and a way of becoming free. In silence, we are free to listen, free to have our sin exposed to us, free to attend to it. But in silence, we also find Christ 
and the grace of the cross. It is very difficult to confront our own sin. Jesus knows this. Even though I've been familiar with the terms Lent, Good Friday, and Holy Week since my childhood, I came to Anglicanism in my adult life, and I've spent the last many years adjusting to the rhythms of the church calendar. And even though it's beautiful and meaningful, the liturgical life can be really hard, and Lent is no exception. The first time I saw the stripping of the altar on Monday, Thursday, I was overcome with emotion and wept. I still cry when I receive the Eucharist. <laughs> Our sin, too, is difficult to bear. Facing it is not easy, even when we know we can be forgiven. And yet, we walk through Lent with resurrection eyes. The Jesus that died and rose again is the Jesus that accompanies us as we walk through the season of Lent. We don't have to wait for Easter to access Jesus. Lent is a time of anticipation of Christ's death and all that comes with contemplating the cross. But even though the season of Lent is difficult, Christ walks beside us. Jesus holds our hands and walks with us as we approach the very cross that he bore for us. Every year since it came out, my husband and I watch the film Silence at some point during Lent. And every year, I dread it. It is a hard film to watch, and I know I need my wits about me to contemplate it well. Confronting sin can seem this way. We know it looms ahead, and the anticipation of it can stifle our efforts before we even start. I imagine the cross must have felt this way for Jesus and he, as he prayed in Gethsemane. But yet he persevered. Not my will, but your will. Jesus knows how difficult it is to face ourselves. In the great divorce, in his infinite love, he sends the spirits a long, long way in hopes that they might be able to help the ghosts who have barely stepped foot into heaven. One spirit tells a ghost, you can lean on me all the way. I can't absolutely carry you, but you need to have almost no weight on your own feet, and it will hurt less at every step. We can lean on Jesus all the way to the cross where we lay our sin at his feet. So, silence is a good place to start. Once we've spent some time there, the Lord has spoken to us, he's illuminated some sin in our life, what then? If you spend some time in silence and feel like the Lord has revealed some sin to you, consider as a next step apologizing for that sin. As we've already said, apologizing is difficult to do if you do it right. If you've sinned against someone, consider making them a real apology, one that starts with, I'm sorry, I. And after that, ask for their forgiveness. Most of the time, when we do apologize, even if it's a good apology, the response is awkward and it doesn't include the phrase, I forgive you. Most of the time, we hear things like, it's okay, no big deal, don't worry about it, it's all good. And these are all really nice sentiments, but none of them is forgiveness. The Lord's Prayer uses really specific words when talking about forgiveness. Um, I'm going to paraphrase a little, but it says, Forgive us our debts and transgressions as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. It does not say, tell someone who has wronged you that it's all good. All right? Forgive in the spirit that Christ forgave. He frequently told people that their sins were forgiven. I can't think of a single time that he said, no worries, dude okay. Now, I'm not saying to apologize to everyone around you for every transgression that you've ever done or make them say the words, I forgive you. Sometimes it is not appropriate, okay? Sometimes apologizing can be more about the apologizer than the apologizee. We don't want that. Don't do it to check a box. We're not trying to be legalistic. But do pray, spend some time in silence, and if it's the right thing, let the Lord speak that to you. But this does not apply to confessing to God. As the psalmist says, against you, you only have I sinned. And it is right to think about and be specific about where we have sinned against the Lord when apologizing to him. If it seems overwhelming, it should be. Our sin is overwhelming. But the forgiveness we have from the cross overwhelms even that overwhelming sin. Which brings me to my last point. Last but not least, accept forgiveness from Christ. I cannot overstate this enough. Once you've confessed, receive forgiveness that is freely yours and let go of that sin. Do not be the wife of Robert who just cannot let it go. Be free. Of course, this is easier said than done. I cannot count the number of times I have prayed the Anglican prayer of confession and thought of certain sins, received forgiveness, and did not feel like those sins were gone. I still felt guilty. I still felt like I'm going to turn around and do the exact same thing again. 
Sometimes it can even feel like our sin is too big for the cross. Sometimes I wonder whether Jesus could really forgive me for what I've done. Sometimes I get to the point where I wonder, could I forgive myself? Not being able to forgive yourself makes you feel like you can't accept forgiveness from Jesus. But accepting forgiveness from him is not about whether I can forgive myself. It is about whether I believe that he is going to do what he promises that he will do. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Faith is not about whether I can rationalize what Jesus says. It's about believing that he will do what he says he's going to do. Confessing my sins means he will forgive them, whether I can make sense of that or not. Faith is ultimately not about me. It's about him. He can forgive you even if you can't forgive yourself. So receive that forgiveness. It might be hard, but you can lean on him the whole way. So start in silence. Ask God to meet you in that silence and to speak to you about what sin you might be holding on to. Ask him to walk with you as you let it die. Think about whether you need to apologize to a specific person or just to Jesus. Ask him to help you do this. And then receive his forgiveness. By embracing that spiritual death, we are ultimately saying yes to Jesus and yes to life. Death of sin is a choice of love and a choice for life. Recognizing our sin allows us to better understand the forgiveness we receive in the grace of Christ. The beginning of spiritual death of sin is silence before God, and he will help us do the rest. I want to close with this quote from chapter 11. It's a prayer of sorts. So, from beyond all place and time, out of the very place, authority will be given you. The strengths that once opposed your will shall be obedient fire in your blood and heavenly thunder in your voice. Overcome us that, so overcome, we may be ourselves. We desire the beginning of your reign as we desire dawn and dew, wetness at the birth of light. Thanks so much for being here tonight.